Well, good morning. Sitting there in the audience, I don't know who this Dennis Vi is, but I think I want to meet him. Well, it's a wonderful day, and certainly welcome to all of you to Huntsville and Redstone Arsenal. It's great to have all of you here for what I know will be a great event for AUSA. Our soldiers, our department, civilians, our industry partners, and the great Tennessee Valley community. General Sullivan, thank you for the very kind introduction. And on behalf of all of us here at Team Redstone, our soldiers, our department civilians, our veterans, and our retirees, thank you for all you and organizations like AUSA do every day for our Army, for the American soldier, and for our families. Words are simply inadequate to express our sincere appreciation for the significant difference you have made personally and professionally, both in uniform and out, and the difference you continue making in the lives of our soldiers, their families and the United States Army and the defense community at large. We're very honored that AUSA chose Huntsville, home of Redstone Arsenal and the Army Materiel Command to host your winter symposium. We're also glad you chose this week. Last week was certainly not the week to have a conference here <laughs> in Redstone. And as I've said to Mayor Battle and Mayor Trulock on many occasions, this is really a big deal, having AUSA here. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a round of applause for the 32nd Army Chief of Staff and CEO and President of AUSA and all the great men and women of AUSA who have placed this conference here in Huntsville. I also want to thank Governor Bentley for his very kind remarks. It was a pleasure to be able and an honor to go down and have an opportunity to meet with him and tell the Army story and tell him about all the things that are going on here uh, at Redstone Arsenal and throughout the state of Alabama and also to speak to the Alabama State Legislature as they recognize uh, Military Appreciation Day. I know Congressman Mo Brooks was scheduled to be here, and I want to also recognize again Mayor Battle and Mayor Trulock. Thank you for your tremendous leadership and your partnership here with the Arsenal. Former Army Materiel Command Commanders, General Retired Lou Wagner, sir, it's great to see you. General Leon Solomon, sir, great to see you. General Griffin is scheduled to be here a little bit later today. It's also great to see General Retired Buck Canan. Sir, great to have you here with us. The civilian aide to the Secretary of the Army for Northern Alabama, Mr. Joe Fitzgerald. Joe, thanks so much for your leadership and all your tremendous support. And I'm very honored to have my second battle buddy. My first battle buddy is my Command Sergeant Major James Sims, but Honorable Heidi Shue. Uh, it's so great to have you here this morning as well. And certainly my sweetheart, Linda. I certainly don't want to go home without mentioning my sweetheart. It's great to see all of you and to all of our fellow general officers, active and retired, members of the Senior Executive Service, our command sergeants majors, our soldiers, our Department of the Army civilians, Department of Defense civilians, and our industry partners. Thanks for being here. The theme for this year's symposium is America's Army, sustaining, training, and equipping for the future. And I think this theme is very appropriate as we began to conclude combat operations in Afghanistan, reset our force after 13 years of combat, prepare for future contingencies in an unpredictable global security environment, take care of our soldiers, civilians, and families who sacrificed so much for the nation over the last 13 plus years, and set the course for the future Army while navigating and physically challenged waters. At Army Materiel Command, in partnership with ASALT, and the leadership of Ms. Shu, and Forces Command, we play a key role in sustaining and equipping the force. And going forward, we are also playing an even more important role, supporting TRADOC and General Bob Cohn in the training of this force. Our Army continues to, as our Army continues to transition in Afghanistan, we must also simultaneously prepare 
our army for the next contingency. For this we can be sure, as history has taught us all too well, there will be a future contingency somewhere in the world that will require army boots on the ground, most likely in a place we'll not be successful in predicting. But we clearly know that our forces must be ready, trained, and equipped to meet that contingency when the nation calls. Our nation expects and demands nothing less. Accordingly, our primary focus at AMC is ensuring the readiness of that force. We also remain vigilant in developing the essential capabilities and technologies our soldiers will need to succeed in the future. As emerging threats and fiscal challenges drive the Army to be smaller, more agile, and more capable, all with fewer resources, there are three things that we must do at AMC. We must continue to modernize our Army's equipment. We must continue to sustain the force of today so it is prepared to meet the challenges of tomorrow. And we must continue to develop capabilities and technologies that will give our soldiers the decisive advantage to meet and defeat any potential future adversary. For the next few minutes, I want to provide you an AMC perspective on what we're doing to maintain that advantage, not just for today's soldier, but for the soldier of the future. But first, after a very challenging year for our Army, during my travels, I most often ask, how is AMC doing? And my response is that AMC is doing well. We're challenged, but we're holding our own. Clearly, 2013 was a very challenging year for our Army, as well as AMC. Sequestration, hiring and promotion freezes, civilian furloughs, overtime restrictions, and the government shutdown provided more than their share of challenges. And no, we don't have all the resources needed to meet every requirement. Every day we make very tough decisions as we balance resources with competing requirements. And like every other Army command and organization, we're undergoing some belt tightening, and we're looking for ways to be more efficient at every level. However, because of the tremendous soldiers and civilians of this command, along with our industry partners, and collectively through their tenacity and perseverance to get the job done, I can confidently say to you this morning that no soldier or Army unit has deployed or will deploy in harm's way without the equipment and materiel they require to accomplish their mission and return home safely to their families. This is our mission at AMC. Bottom line is our resilient 60,000 plus workforce delivered. Even in the midst of substantial challenges that impacted them both personally and professionally, they continue to deliver. And I could not be more proud to serve as their commander. AMC remains a global material enterprise powerhouse, providing predictive readiness to our Army and the Joint Force. Our nine major subordinate commands continue to provide the soldier world-class support each and every day. From aviation to missiles and munitions, from C4ISR to contracting, from ground combat vehicles and power to research and development solutions, from installation logistics, support, and sustainment of Army prepositioned stocks to the destruction of chemical weapons. These commands deliver readiness every day across the force. And our Army's organic industrial base continues to be a centerpiece for Army readiness, resetting our Army's equipment after a decade plus of war. Last year, our industrial base reset the equivalent of 25 brigade combat teams worth of equipment. And this year, we will reset over 120,000 additional items, 
including 530 and 2,300 wheeled vehicles, 260 aircraft, over 3,000 missiles, more than 17,000 masts, 33,000 ground and airborne radio systems, and over 25,000 small arms weapons. Meanwhile, across our industrial base facilities, we generated over $5 billion in revenue, including providing over $1 billion in parts and depot work to our sister services. Over the past year in Afghanistan, working in concert with our strategic partners, Transcom and DLA, AMC units have retrograded nearly 14,000 pieces of equipment and one of the largest and most complex retrograde missions in the history of our military. We reduced 43,000 shipping containers, which you've laid them, if you laid them end to end, would stretch along I-95 from the Pentagon to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And since June, last June, <clears throat> we've helped close 72 forward operating bases as our forces transition security responsibilities to the Afghan forces. Our Joint Munitions Command delivered over 5,300 tons of ammunition to the theater. And at Lake City Army Ammunition Plant, this past year they produced the one billionth small arms round. Our 73 Logistics Readiness Centers, or LRCs, formerly known as the DOLs, Director of Logistics, have positioned AMC to provide logistics support from the national to the installation level at every major Army post, camp, and station. This has initially saved our Army and the command over $200 million a year, while still providing critical installation services, maintenance, supply, and transportation support. Our LRCs along with our combatant command-aligned Army Field Support Brigades, transportation brigades, and contracting brigades have ensured that AMC is postured to provide maximum logistics and sustainment support to our combatant commands and our Army regionally aligned forces. And last year, our Security Assistance Command generated more than 4,600 cases in support of 145 countries, totaling more than $10 billion in foreign military sales. We expect continued and sustained growth in FMS, especially with increasing requirements for maintenance, support, training, and life cycle management. And last year, the Army Contracting Command issued more than 190,000 contracts totaling nearly $61 billion. ACC continues to obligate $1 out of every $7 of total federal contracts, an enormous responsibility, especially coming out of a year like we had in 2013, but they did phenomenal work. So as I stated, AFC is doing well. We have challenges, but we're well postured to support our Army and its priorities going forward, in large part because of the great men and women who serve in this great command. But back to what we're doing to maintain the technological advantage I spoke about earlier for today's, and most importantly, tomorrow's soldier. For decades, the Army Materiel Command has defined the space between the state of the art and the art of the possible. And we're working very hard to improve the way we protect, unburden, empower, and sustain the soldier. AMC manages a comprehensive science and technology portfolio, averaging $1.6 billion annually. That represents approximately 75% of the Army's annual investment in S&T. We have more than 13,000 scientists and engineers working towards development of solutions which will make our Army's equipment and materiel more efficient, more lethal, more reliable, safer, and less expensive to maintain. Their efforts have dramatically improved the Army's global response capabilities and combat effectiveness, 
and help to reduce the logistics tail. Our research and development centers and labs continue to take technologies from the drawing board to prototypes and then on to production of new solutions or additive capabilities for existing ones. And our R&D forward elements and international technology centers rigorously search for new technologies and solutions around the globe, facilitating partnerships with governments, industry, academia, and our allies to ensure the warfighter has the best state-of-the-art technology, material, and capabilities available. At AMC, we understand that it takes a team effort, government, industry, and academia to produce R&D successes. And I personally believe that this is the most important work we'll do for our Army, for your Army, over the next decade. And we must get it right. Our cooperative research and development agreements are all aimed at producing breakthrough technologies and improvements in soldier survivability, sustainability, mobility, combat effectiveness, and quality of life in the field environment. These investments will produce the critical solutions our soldiers will need for future mission success, just as similar investments have produced in the past. And my message to industry is that AMC is aggressively looking for more of these opportunities. Our recently established Chief Technology Office, led by Dr. Grace Bohannik, is leading the way, working with ASALT, TRADOC, and our Life Cycle Management Commands, AMCOM, TACOM, CECOM, and JMC, including our research and development centers. Recently, I visited some of our R&D facilities to include the Army Research Lab at Adelphi, Maryland, the Natick Soldier Systems Center in Massachusetts, and TARDEX Ground Systems Power and Energy Lab, or GSPEL, in Warren, Michigan, where they are testing equipment at temperatures ranging from 160 degrees Fahrenheit to 60 degrees below zero. Honorable Shu and I personally witnessed those two temperature extremes about three weeks ago. I witnessed some very impressive solutions and potential game-changing technologies, some near-term and available soon, and others on the horizon, but all cutting-edge solutions made possible by sustained investments in R&D by our Army and collaborative efforts with industry and academia. And we're just touching the surface of what's possible. Multiple efforts to protect the soldier are underway. The Army Combat Uniform Alternate, or ACUA, compared to the original ACUs, which were designed principally for male soldiers. The new ACUA fits a wider range of body types and sizes. This improvement has become even more essential as the role of female soldiers has evolved over the course of the two recent wars. The new uniform is tailored differently with special features to enhance comfort and performance. And when put to the test, 94% of soldiers found the new ACUA presented a better military fit and appearance. At the NADOC Soldier Systems Center, engineers are developing the helmet, electronics, and display system, upgraded protection, un upgradable protection known as Heads Up. It provides mounted and dismounted troops with a more fully integrated headgear system with new technologies, including improved ballistic materials, non-ballistic impact liner materials and design, better eye, face, and hearing protection, and improved communications. And in addition to the ASUA, the female improved outer tactical vest was named one of Time Magazine's best inventions of the year. The new vest worn by the soldier on the left side of the stage is five pounds lighter it is a replacement for the interceptor body armor, 
which you can see worn by the soldier on the right side of the stage. The previous standard tactical vest negatively impacted female soldier range of motion, particularly when getting in and out of tight spaces and are positioning the rifles against their shoulders. First issued to soldiers deploying to Afghanistan in September 2012, the new vest is now available for deploying forces. <clears throat> and in an effort to unburden the soldier, Natick is working on a conformal wearable battery, or CWB. This near future technology provides the soldier with rechargeable batteries that integrate into their armor. Worn within the soldier's tactical vest, CWB provides a safe, high energy, portable, and mobile energy solution that eliminates the need for multiple heavy boxed type batteries. The difference in size is easily seen, and trust me, talking to the soldiers, they can certainly feel the difference in the weight. Efforts to lighten the soldier's load also can be seen with cutting edge technologies like the fuel cell Talon. The new fuel cell Talon automatically recharges onboard batteries when needed, enabling significantly longer lasting combat support. Built with all weather, day and night, and amphibious capabilities, the Talon can operate under most adverse conditions, overcome almost any terrain, even climb stairs. Its camera, camera can transmit in multiple spectrums, including night vision. It has a versatile arm with multiple attachments to enable remote search. And it can serve as a platform for a variety of weapons, including the M16, the M240 machine gun, or the 40 millimeter, 40 millimeter grenade launcher. Other technologies which you probably read about recently include the autonomous robotic mobility systems, which provide military vehicles with an optically manned capability, increasing safety and flexibility in how assets and personnel are deployed. This capability was recently demonstrated at Fort Hood, Texas, utilizing manned and unmanned convoy vehicles. The goal of this effort is fully autonomous military vehicles that can operate in both urban and rural environments. The intention is to integrate this technology into military vehicles through a kit that contains primary intelligence and autonomous decision-making capabilities. The potential to increase logistics flexibility and more importantly, reduce soldier fatalities is enormous. To help empower the soldier, we developed the Lethal Miniature Aerial Munitions System, or LMAMS. It can be operated by a single soldier and has the capability to engage targets beyond current line of sight weapons. It can operate autonomously, semi-autonomously, or manually, and it can track stationary or fleeting targets without further operator input. And at the Armament Research Development and Engineering Center in Picatinny Arsenal, New Jersey. They're also empowering a soldier with cutting edge solutions like the light machine gun, or LMG. Providing significant weight reduction, the LMG unburdens the saw gunner, who is the most heavily burdened soldier in the squad. Compared to the M249 saw, the light machine gun is 41% lighter for the gunner, with a 12% reduction in ammunition volume. When we speak of empowering the soldier, we must also think about new ways of reducing fuel consumption. One standout in this effort is the fuel-efficient ground vehicle demonstrator, or FED, being developed by TARDAC. While the vehicle itself isn't intended to go into mass production, the components, technology, and lessons learned from its development are, are being spiraled into the current and future fleets. To date, the team has been able to improve fuel efficiency by more than 90 percent by incorporating cutting-edge technology from the commercial industry. We took an earlier version of this vehicle out to Jay Leno's garage, and he was extremely impressed, especially driving it down the Los Angeles Highway. 
That was the only nervous part of the visit that I had out there uh, to his show. The Fed is an example, a great example, of how the Army, industry, and academia can partner to produce outstanding improvements in materiel for our military. Another innovation to better sustain the soldiers through advanced coatings technology. This development produces a fabric surface that once applied becomes highly durable and resistant to liquid and dirt. The coatings also protect from toxic liquids. And in the near future, this could significantly improve soldier protection from chemical and biological agents. However, one of the most promising technologies to sustain a soldier is additive manufacturing, commonly known as 3D printing. The potential benefits of this new technology include smaller, lighter electronics, and the ability to produce items on the spot. The future may involve solutions like the Expeditionary Mobile Lab, a 20-foot container equipped with 3D printers, computer-assisted milling machines, and lasers, plasma, and water cutters. This will allow soldiers in the field to directly communicate <clears throat> excuse me, with engineers on the need uh, or a requirement, and the parts can be fabricated on site, reducing downtime and increasing readiness at a significantly reduced cost. And as we all know, especially our veterans in the audience, most essential for sustaining a soldier is food. Our scientists have made significant improvements to the MRE, a meals ready to eat, making them as appetizing in the field as the day they were first produced. The new MRE now maintains its, maintains its high quality for a guaranteed chef life of up to three years. And as I'm sure Lieutenant General Patty Horho will be pleased to know, these MREs satisfy the Surgeon General's strict nutritional requirements for operational rations. And its packaging allows MREs to be transported anywhere in the world, including airdroppable by parachute. And a pizza MRE is finally coming soon to our soldiers, the most requested MRE item today. Earlier this week, NBC's Brian Roberts, excuse me, Brian Williams, reported on this new item being tested at Natick. In fact, we have some samples being handed out for some of you in the front row, with more available at the Army exhibit. Everybody knows there's nothing like a slice of cold pizza in the morning. <laughs> These material solutions that I've just highlighted, and there are only a few, are but a glance into what AMC's engineers and scientists are researching and developing and a glimpse into what's possible in the future as we move towards Force 2025 and beyond. We're also working towards the next generation of munitions that will give the operator the ability to divert rounds in flight. The next generation of 3D printing could be forward deployed with the squad and utilized to build virtually any required tool or repair part and we're advancing towards visual displays to project real-time information and data into the helmets of our soldiers. Working in partnership with industry and academia, along with a sustained level of, of resourcing by our Army, I'm confident we can maintain the technological edge that will produce the next generation vertical lift, ground vehicle, night vision advancement, and overmatch capabilities in our next weapon systems, all while protecting and preserving what Army has worked so hard to achieve over the past decade. The increasingly complex and austere operational environments that our forces will deploy to tomorrow will rely heavily upon our ability to become more agile and respond more rapidly than ever before. As we support the soldier of the future, we must strive to discover the leap ahead technologies that will allow our Army to maintain its technological edge. The Army and AMC, along with the help of our partners in ASALT and every industry partner here today, must continue to ensure our top priority remains 
providing for the joint warfighter the equipment and material they require to accomplish their mission. Everything we do now and into the future must have this singular focus. The joint warfighter, our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, and the civilians who support them are depending on us for their success. As I conclude, I would like to remind everyone that now we have a new generation of veterans rejoining communities across America. As combat operations conclude in Afghanistan and we continue to draw down our forces over the coming years, many of these veterans will be returning to the civilian workforce. These patriots and their families have sacrificed greatly for the nation. They've done what their nation asked them to do. They deserve an opportunity to transition into a good job that will allow them to pursue the American dream they fought to protect. Through their service and their sacrifice, and especially the service and sacrifice of their families, they certainly have earned it. Lastly, over the course of the next few days, I invite you to visit the Army exhibit where you can meet and speak with not only these soldiers here, but also subject matter experts on the floor to talk about the technologies that I've highlighted this morning, to talk about technologies that you want to highlight to us this morning, along with many, many more, because it's these forums that allow us to have this type of exchange and dialogue. Again, General Sullivan, I want to thank you again, sir, and also AUSA for this wonderful opportunity to share a few thoughts with you this morning about this command I'm privileged to lead. I also want to thank our soldiers and civilians who volunteered to demonstrate these technologies and thank all of you for your continued support of our great Army. AMC, sustaining the strength of the nation, Army Strong. Thank you. The question is, sir, do you want me to take that? Okay. I have two questions. I think I have, uh, sir, how important is logistic support of military sales systems to our international partners for added security? Particularly given a smaller U.S. Army and budget, can industry help? And I would tell you the answer is yes, across the board. Uh, when I spoke about foreign military sales, uh, and I know General Dale Turner will be here today and members from the United States Army Security Assistance Command, as I mentioned, we'll approach $10 billion in foreign military sales, uh, over 4,000 cases in 145 countries. We're seeing an increase. Our allies, they uh, want American equipment. They, uh, they are buying American equipment. And not only buying just the equipment, they're buying the sustainment of that equipment, the logistical support of that equipment. And certainly industry can help in a huge way. We're also working very hard to, as we sell those systems, especially those that uh, come from some of our stockage, to re, uh, uh, refurbish those through our depots and arsenals, uh, a way to continue to preserve our workforce and the skill sets there. So to answer across the board, yes, industry can help. Uh, we'll have our t folks here today to ask some specific questions that you have, but the answer is yes. Industry can help in a huge way. And the second question, what initiatives is AMC taking to support strategy, shift, emphasis on the Pacific region? Great question. I spoke about the Army Field Support Brigades that we have stationed across the um, United States and overseas, along with our um, transportation brigades and our contracting support brigades. These elements, along with many other Army elements, space and missile, C4ISR, engineers, are forward deploy deployed and they are aligned with the combatant commanders today. So when Army talks about regional aligned forces, we already have a footprint established. We're providing that support, logistics, contracting, and across those other function areas every day. Uh, as we ba rebalance towards the Pacific, our intent is to establish a brigade, an Army Field Support Brigade, in the Pacific region in 15, already in discussions with General Brooks, um, who is the P U.S. Army Pacific Command commander. And we've already got a foundation established uh, that they're building that uh, as we move towards um, that, that organization. 
We're also looking at Army prepositioned stocks and a wartime reserves and where, in fact, we have alternate locations that we may place uh, stocks because we know we can get our soldiers there in, a, in a, a short duration in terms of a contingency, but getting the equipment there is a whole new matter. So we're looking at APS and other strategies to shorten the timeline uh, if we have to deploy a force to the Pacific. And the last, we want to continue to look at R&D as we talked about. With the distances involved in the Pacific region, vertical lift is critically important for the future. I'm certain uh, Honorable Shu will talk to you about anti-access, anti-denial, and some of the other technologies that we have to pursue if we, in fact, have to have a, uh, if we face some type of conflict in the Pacific region. Uh, two great questions. General Sullivan, I think that's it, sir.